Uh, we are um, Nick and uh, Philip, and um, we would like to talk about um, serverless and GraphQL today. And we are also um, announcing a very cool project, a serverless boilerplate or starter kit you can use. But before we jump right into this, I would like to give you a quick introduction about um, the serverless framework and um, what the serverless framework basically is, because this starter kit is based on this serverless framework and um, why you should use it. So let's um, imagine we want to like to we would like to build an authentication system. So for example, we would like to uh, provide a functionality so that users can log in, can sign up, can recover their passwords and stuff like that. So if you would like to move this to a serverless application and uh, benefit from all the stuff you get from Lambda, you would basically write your code, for example, the code to uh, sign up the user. Then you would zip up this code, you would upload this code to an S3 bucket on AWS, and then you would um, specify and set up the um, infrastructure which should trigger this Lambda function. So for example, you would set up an API endpoint on API gateway, hook this up to your Lambda function, so each and every time someone triggers or yeah, accesses this um, API endpoint, your Lambda function will be triggered. And, but this way, from your, basically your um, authentication microservice, you only have this login function implemented yet. So you would like to, or you have to do this for the sign up function as well, this process. So write the code, zip it, upload it to S3, set up the infrastructure so that your function will be triggered. And you would do this, uh, the same step again for your recover password functionality and stuff like that, up upload uh, profile photos, it's really a tedious process you, because you would like to, or you have to do this manually each and every time. And there are many other different problems and challenges you have to, uh, or you face when you do this that way. And those are basically, for example, how would you manage multiple Lambda functions as a whole uh, service? How would you work with team members on your project? What about multiple regions and stages you would like to deploy to? For example, a production stage and um, a development stage. And what about code sharing? Because some of your Lambda functions might share a common code base. And what if you would even like to deploy, for example, to uh, Google Cloud Functions or IBM OpenWhisk or stuff like that? And yeah, those are the challenges you will face if you do this manually. And Lucky enough, uh, serverless has you covered. So we basically created the serverless framework. And uh, with a serverless framework, we think in services. So for example, in microservices, like I already said, in the user uh, microservice case, we have, for example, a resize picture function. So each and every time a user uploads a new picture, this picture will be resized. You would maybe also have a reminder function. So on a, um, for example, every two hours, the user will get a reminder, or even if a user wants to sign up, uh, we have a create function. So you bundle all those functions inside of a directory, you write the function logic, and now all you have to do is install serverless, which is an NPM package, so it's a CLI tool, you install it, and then you just drop this serverless.yaml file you see here, inside of your service, and then you just have to specify for each function which event should be used to trigger this function. So for example, we have here the resize picture function. You wrote this code for this thing, and now in the serverless.yaml file you simply say, okay, this will um, be triggered each and every time a picture will be uploaded in the picture S3 bucket. And for example, we also have the reminder function here. We wrote the code. And inside of our serverless.yaml file, we simply say we would like to have a scheduled event, and every two hours we would like that this um, event triggers our Lambda function. And the same with the create function here. We say, okay, we would like to have an HTTP endpoint, and every time this endpoint is visited or data is sent to it, we would like that our handler users.create is triggered, so our function is triggered. And then the only thing we need to do here we have written or wrote our uh, functions. 
and have dropped this serverless.yaml file inside of it. We just run serverless deploy and serverless will pass this file and understands what, it's, what it needs to do to set up the whole infrastructure. So it will set up, for example, the S3 bucket for you. It will set up the scheduled event and it will also set up all the API gateway stuff for you so that you have a post endpoint which is available under uh, slash users. And this is really powerful because you now you have only have only to focus on your functions and your function code and you can just run serverless deploy and everything is up and running in a few seconds. And uh, Lambda was basically started, or when Lambda was started, the main purpose of Lambda was data processing. So let's imagine we are Netflix and um, some movie studios upload a file to an S3 bucket, then we can utilize Lambda to process the video file, for example. And um, this was a very common use case for Lambda, but nowadays, uh, because of API Gateway, we have the whole the um, possibility to basically create a whole web application which runs completely serverless. And um, we've seen many different architectural patterns users use. So for example, we have the microservices architectural pattern, which means you have one job per function. So for example, log in, sign up, recover password, and you have one endpoint which will point to this function. Then there's also the, ser the services architectural pattern, which means you have some related code, multiple um, related jobs per function, and multiple endpoints, which will point to that. Then you have the monolithic one. This is, this is a really interesting one. You basically put everything inside of one Lambda function, and you have multiple endpoints, which will point to that. And the other one, which arised, was the Graph, uh, GraphQL architectural pattern. And this means that your GraphQL is inside your Lambda function, and you have one endpoint, which we already saw in the previous talk, and now your Lambda function manages the data patching for you. And um, I would like to hand over to Nick, who will just uh, show you now the GraphQL boilerplate and explain this to you in detail. Hello, everybody. So um, I want to introduce you to like, how to combine them, how to use the serverless framework and GraphQL together. Um, and let me quickly recap. Um, so what we want to do is we have to want to have this one endpoint uh, that gives you all the power of GraphQL and combine it with easy deployment. And because we started to use GraphQL and serverless um, for building our platform a couple months ago, uh, and we really figured out we love it, it's amazing to use, um, we actually wanted to share this with you. And so what we did is we extracted from our current application um, and starter kit or boilerplate that allows you to uh, take this thing, clone it, um, do like a couple minute setup stuff and basically deploy it up in production. And I find this like I'm super excited about it because if you use GraphQL, I mean there's a couple of templates out there or uh, starter kits, but then you use Express, then you again have to deploy it somewhere and you don't know how it scales. But the power of Lambda is, is that theoretically it scales indefinitely. And so you can basically set it in, in front of every REST API or, or your data backend. Um, and it just runs and it, it works uh, really, really well. So we, we, ca we extract this from our current application. And you can take this and deploy it. Um, yeah. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the features so you can get a feel of what's in there uh, and what we share with you. Um, as already mentioned, it's production ready. Uh, just take it, deploy it. But what we learned on the way is it's really useful, especially for UI development, to have kind of an offline setup where you actually use a, a mock data. Um, and so we built this into this boilerplate. So you can run this in two ways. You can either run this uh, with npm run start remote, and then it will actually invoke uh, the, the remote database or whatever database you set up there, or call different lambdas. That's what we do. Um, or you can just mock the data locally. And this allows you to go into edge cases for UI development and makes it really, really fast and easy to develop. Um, it's all based on Node, so it uses GraphQL JS, obviously it uses serverless, um, React, Recompose, CSS modules, Webpack, uh, Chest, all the like fancy new stuff that we use nowadays. 
um, but it comes in two versions, and that's the best part because there are two like there are two major um, JavaScript clients out there for GraphQL. Uh, for one, there's Relay built by Facebook, uh, and the other one is Apollo uh, built by the Meteor team. And both are really awesome. Both have their up and down sides. Um, but I highly recommend to check them out, and I, I want to thank uh, the Apollo team a lot for like contributing to this, so that you actually can get started with both versions. All right. Uh, now that I have your attention, I want to walk you a little bit of like the structure and explain how it's it's set up. Um, it basically consists of like four directories, which is the API directory, the app foundation, and GraphQL, um, and I get started right away with the most interesting part, the GraphQL part. And that's pretty straightforward, um, typical GraphQL setup. Um, in this case, we use Relay. Um, so you have this node.js, which basically is, is a, a node structure, a node file a JavaScript class that you inherit as an interface. Um, it has the schema, and the schema is the core. The schema is the part that you share between backend and frontend. And um, the schema is the one that allows you to do all the cool magical stuff with GraphQL. Um, it has the type system, um, so you can create your types as, as we already have seen in the previous talk, and in this case also utils. Um, and types look exactly the same. The only uh, special thing we have in this setup is that um, instead of directly calling Lambdas, uh, what we did is we basically wrapped the database into it's just a an, an, uh, JavaScript module which exports all the uh, functions to fetch your data. And in this case, we import from the database uh, this module and say get fewer, for example. But we did what we did here is um, based on your environment variable, how you start the, the setup, we use either the mock database or we use the data database um, where you fetch the stuff from, from probably your Lambda. Um, and yeah, this is basically how your, I mean, it, this is super simple and straightforward. This is how your mock database looks like. Uh, so you can do whatever you want in here. And in our case, we, we create a couple of things and, and um, show them. And uh, uh, even like based on setup, you could uh, create different kinds of um, data setups you have. Uh, the next part, um, uh, the second of the four directors is the API folder. And this is super simple and straightforward. It basically has four files. It's the handle.js, um, the shrink wrap, just to make sure you always get the right modules, package JSON and serverless YAML. And the handler is, again, um, basically what we have seen in the previous talk, just a handler to um, get the body from the event, from the HTTP event, the API gateway, take the query, take the variables, pass them to the schema, GraphQL, and GraphQL does all the magic with the resource functions. Uh, package JSON, super slick and simple. Um, in this case, we just have Bubble Polyfill, um, GraphQL, GraphQL Relay, uh, JSON Web Token. If you need authentication, but if not, you can actually drop it out. Um, so very slick setup, and this actually helps a lot to uh, speed up like uh, the cold starts of your Lambda functions. And last but not least, the uh, serverless YAML. And the only thing you have to do to set up an HTTP endpoint with this GraphQL uh, handler is basically uh, take the, say that the handler file has a GraphQL method. Um, you specify it with the handler. Um, it takes an HTTP event, which the path is GraphQL. Um, it's a post method because a GraphQL, you can run GraphQL with get as far as I know, but I've never seen that. Usually it always takes post, and I highly recommend that. And of course, you want to set up a uh, course um, and that's really convenient. You just have to take course true, and it already serves the options pre-flight request um, and sets up the correct headers. Last but um, actually, the second last is the app, and there is also this is just a simple React application. There's nothing special here. The only thing that might stand out is that y you can see in the router because we use Relay. In this case, we have to apply the router middleware. Um, and that gives us the benefit that we actually pair routes, can define um, what queries to fetch. But if you use Apollo, it looks a little bit different. And um, it's actually really straightforward and not, not 
too hard to do. Last but not least, we have a Dark Dark Foundation, and this is where we can where we keep all the, the magical stuff that you don't need to know much about. It's, it's a dev server which runs um, on local hosts. If you, if you start locally, um, it has some, it has, um, uh, in the GraphQL part, you have some tooling to set up, um, to uh, regenerate the schema. Uh, the chess part contains, um, contains mocking for, for CSS modules and other stuff, but it's, and also the Webpack. So we have a Webpack set up for production for, and for development. And yeah, so far so good. All right, so how you can use it. For once, you can simply do npm start and um, check it out, run npm start, and it will just run on localhost. And as you can see in this case, um, it initially the, the initial setup or the boilerplate just fetches the viewer uh, with its name. And you can see the GraphQL request um, being done here. And in this case, our user is uh, Ada Lopez. But the part where I'm really, really excited about is that you actually can run npm run deploy. And there's like one to two things. You have to set up a unique bucket up front and uh, re replace the code in, in two steps. And then you have to um, uh, deploy the thing. But like if you have done that, then like every time you run npm uh, run deploy, you basically get this for free, really powerful um, production version of your GraphQL endpoint. And I find this really, really amazing. Yeah, just run it, it deploys, and in the end, you're up and running and have GraphQL in production. So when can you use it? Um, because it's, for once, really cool to use it for new projects, but we're not having ev new projects every day. Um, so what I've seen a couple of times and what I highly recommend you to do and why I think this is actually might be useful to you is you can actually use this for new applications, but you could also use it to wrap your existing REST API. Because what you can do is you can take this thing, um, deploy it, and this thing scales because it's AWS Lambda. So you can take this, wrap your existing uh, REST API, and just fill with it and then demonstrate to your coworkers, to your CTO or whoever, that you actually can build an interface on top of your REST API that is queryable, so it becomes more efficient. You only fetch what you need, and it's way easier to use, and it can use all the um, amazing stack um, that like, we, we gained over the last one to two years in JavaScript with React, um, Relay or Apollo, um, Chest, all the cool stuff. And I find this super exciting. Um, I've, I'm lucky that I can work on a new application, but I've seen a couple of people being super happy just wrapping the REST APIs and then having the benefit of GraphQL um, in the front end. And that's it so far. Thank you very much. <laughs>